this and let me. Let me again introduce myself. My name is Terry Rockefeller. I'm a member of September 11th Families for Peaceful Tomorrows. We were one of the founding organizations of United for Peace and Justice. And today I have the honor of being the co-convener of the steering committee, the coordinating committee, uh, along with Jackie Cabasso, who you're gonna hear from very shortly. We're very excited um, about the positive response this webinar has had, because I think it gets back to what United for Peace and Justice um, was originally created to do and did very well in the opposition to the war in Iraq, which is to bring together local groups and national groups and inspire them to work in concerted ways on issues of war, militarism, disarmament, peace, racial justice, and changing the shameless practices of our government. Um, we're really pleased to have member groups who are gonna be presenting their work. And I think that what has really inspired us is to think about the power of a network. And so I'm going to introduce my partner um, in co in crime, um, helping to um, steer the coordinating committee of United for Peace and Justice, Jackie Cabasso, executive director of Western States Legal Foundation in Oakland, which she has done brilliantly since 1994. And um, she was a founding mother of Abolition 2000 the global network to eliminate nuclear weapons. And she continues to serve on their coordinating committee. She's also been an executive advisor to Mayors for Peace and was the recipient of the International Peace Bureau's Sean McBride Peace Award. She is going to be speaking to us about the value of networks. And let me just say at this point, Please put any questions you have in the chat. I'm going to be moderating the questions and, um, and, and trying to put them all together for a Q&A session that we hope will be about a half hour at the end. So Jackie, let me turn it over to you. Um, unmute. Sorry about that. <laughs> And Terry, just one correction. I've actually been at Western States Legal Foundation since 1984, not 1994. Oh, well, you sent me the wrong information. <laughs> well, it's because I was trying to do too many things at once, which is a problem for all of us, I think. In any case, um, I am going to talk a little bit about the value of networks in movement building. Um, networks can be built at the local, regional, national, and international levels. And I believe that networks organized around common values and vision rather than single issues have the potential to build the kind of broad movements we will need to create the political pressure to make possible essential changes in our societies and our government's priorities. Building networks can be a strategy for movement building when movements are at a low ebb, like now, when there is not a mass peace movement or a nuclear disarmament movement. From my own experience, I can report that networks can serve as powerful vehicles for small and local groups to amplify their own efforts and provide mutual aid and support. Networks can also serve as a vehicle for national, regional, local, and international groups to develop relationships and work together. And one of the reasons I mentioned 1984 was because I can't stress enough the importance of showing up and staying with it for the long term. So let me give you a few examples of, of uh, our work in networks. So Western States Legal Foundation is a small organization, just two staff people. Uh, its focus is on nuclear disarmament, uh, but long ago we began to understand that nuclear weapons were part of a much larger system and that we were never going to be able to win on nuclear weapons without connecting with other issues, looking for root causes and trying to build a broad multi-issue movement. So 
even though we're small, <clears throat> our organization has devoted a lot of its staff resources to kind of serving as mom <laughs> for a, a series of, of um, networks and coalitions at the local, national, and international levels. Um, first, I'll talk about Western States and UFPJ. Uh, we have been opposed to every U.S. war and, uh, and invasion since we started and, and also committed to nonviolence. So it was natural that we would be involved with United for Peace and Justice from the beginning. Uh, and in fact, uh, I believe that I was at every initial planning meeting <clears throat> for UFPJ, even though I'm based in California. And uh, at its first national conference, which was probably 2002 or three, but I think it was 2002. I uh, brought, I, I got together a, a group of nuclear disarmament advocate NGOs and we came in with a proposal that UFPJ make, should make nuclear disarmament one of its, one of its priorities, a priority. And we were met with a very strange reaction, which is, Nuclear disarmament, that's the Bush agenda. Well, that's because of course there had been, Bush was was planning to attack Iraq based on the false um, allegation that Iraq had nuclear weapons, which of course it didn't. In the meantime, the United States had drawn up provisional plans for using tactical nuclear weapons in Iraq. And this illustrated the incredible disconnect that had developed since the end of the Cold War uh, between the nuclear disarmament movement and the peace movement. So our proposal was adopted, but nuclear weapons remained very far at the, at the perimeters of UFPJ's work for many years, but I kept showing up <laughs> at every steering committee meeting and eventually ended up on this, was elected to the steering committee and work, worked in support of a lot of other issue areas and eventually nuclear disarmament moved to the center of the anti-war and peace movements because, because people realized how central they are. Uh, so in the mom role, having served on the coordinating committee, uh, or before that, I, I started UFPJ's first working group, which was called Nuclear Disarmament and Redefining Security, uh, which met for many years before I was elected to the coordinating committee, and then eventually was asked to serve as co-convener. So still small organization, GFPJ has works with a lot of large organizations and small organizations. But as I said, it's been a, it's a way that small groups can amplify their own efforts and find ways to work in collaboration with lots of other organizations. Um, if I have time, I'd like to go back to another example. We've been One involved- minute. One minute. One minute. Okay, one minute then. I'll just say that one of the local coalitions that we formed, we established was People's Nonviolent Response Coalition in 2002 locally to respond to the, again, to the Iraq war. And we, we formed its multi-issue around the core value of nonviolence. In our statement, we said we see all too clearly that responding to violence with more violence creates an escalating cycle that threatens to spiral out of control. We reject the idea that we are doomed to a future of endless death and destruction. Nonviolence is a belief that change is possible. Nonviolence is hope. And this history brings us right up to the present with the Poor People's Campaign, which Reverend Theo Harris will talk about later. Thanks. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I hope that inspired some of you to be thinking about um, how to maybe expand and develop the work that you're doing. We're gonna turn now to Carly Town, uh, who's uh, with Code Pink and also on the coordinating committee of United for Peace and Justice, but works with Divest from the War Machine uh, and has many local examples of how this is being uh, developed. She brings experience with feminist organizing to her work. And she is currently a national co-director of Code Pink. Carly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Terry. And it's great to um, have everyone here. Um, so like Terry said, I just wanted to talk a little bit today about our Divest from the War Machine campaign at Code Pink, um, which seeks to divest invested assets from companies that profit from going to war. Uh, slide, please. 
So today, I just wanted to talk us through um, two different phases of divestment campaigns to study tactics and tools we can use to develop effective campaigns that actually activate people in our communities to really take on some of the most powerful companies in the world, right? So I'm just gonna review a case study of how gathering investment information, a task that can seem pretty daunting, um, can actually be part of building a strong campaign, right? Um, so we'll also review our weapons free fund, which is a key resource to screen investments once you've actually gathered some of that investment information. Uh, slide, please. So as people can see here on the screen, um, part of our campaign really is exposing the role that war profiteers play in our day-to-day -day lives. And it's really essential to this campaign because companies like Raytheon and General Dynamics and Lockheed Martin engage in public relations campaigns to obscure how they actually make a profit, right? Which is by making a killing on killing. Um, as you can see, right, this graphic lays out how the US war machine operates to influence our politicians, our national budget, and even our local communities in a very cyclical process. Um, and while this analysis is not all encompassing, it is really important because it also offers activists key points of intervention and ways to organize in our local communities against the war machine. So slide, please. So some of that, the way that that takes place in our local communities is we develop um, institutional level divestment campaigns because like I've said, right, they can drive a new conversation, not only around divesting from war, but also investing in socially responsible priorities. Um, so we work to develop campaigns at the city, the state, and the university or school level. Slide, please. Um, so our work on divestment campaigns begins by doing really vital research and gathering information about whether or not institutions are invested in war profiteers and the extent of those investments, right? So next slide, please. Um, receiving the investment portfolio or investment information from an institution is really essential. Um, and like I said earlier, right, this can feel really overwhelming to people, but it also presents opportunities to activate people. So slide, please. So I'll give you an example, um, what's on the screen here, right? In the beginning stages of the campaign to divest Chicago from the war machine, um, activists uncovered that the Municipal Employees Annuity and Benefit Fund of Chicago um, might have investments in the war machine. And when they were researching the website, they saw that the person who's being uh, circled here, Steve Yoon, the investment officer for the benefit fund, um, and they, they reached out to him for comment or to try to ask about more information, right? They sent in multiple emails, they had multiple phone calls, they even had a local alderman staff try to request this information and they still never got a response. So next slide. You know, this could have been really daunting, right? Activists gathered, they decided next steps, and they decided it didn't have to be an obstacle. It could actually be an opportunity to engage people who had actually signed up to learn more about the campaign while doing some list building work. So activists created a call script and a simple calendar and asked volunteers to sign up for a few days over a two week period until every day people were calling Steve Yoon's office every day asking for this investment information. And lo and behold, that worked. Uh, finally, they talked to someone in person and they told them to, to file a FOIA, um, a Freedom of Information Act request. So next slide. Um, you know, instead of silence and like uncertainty, this gave them a concrete next step. So with the help of an organization called Muckrock, um, they filed a FOIA request and learned that the, this fund in Chicago is actually invested in weapons companies. So slide, please. Um, so we're really, really excited because the campaign has now progressed to a point where um, just yesterday, Alderman Ramirez Rosa in Chicago officially introduced our resolution to divest from the war machine um, into the Chicago City Council. And we're now working to generate that support. Uh, so next slide. So I think this is just a really good example um, that you know transparency can really be a win in these campaigns and it can lead to an opportunity to build a stronger campaign and a stronger base of people who are working to pass a divestment uh, resolution. So next slide, please. Um, you know, once we actually have access to the investment documents, like the activists in Chicago, we have to really be able to dig into those investments um, and see what our institutions are actually investing in, right? 
So thankfully, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, Code Pink is joined with an organization, As You Sow, to develop a searchable database of commonly held mutual funds and ETFs to determine if investments or your institution's investments are tied to weapons of war. You can see that on the screen and I'll post it in the chat box as well. Um, but if we go to the next slide, you'll see that- One minute, Carly. Thank you. You'll see that this is a, a powerful tool because it enables everyone to do this vital research, right? Once you have the names of these funds, you plug them in here. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that you can actually look and see that every single one of the funds from, from this BlackRock, uh, which is the world's largest asset manager, is actually invested in weapons companies, right? And if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see that each fund itself has a breakdown of what those funds are actually invested in. Is it military weapons? Is it nuclear weapons? Is it gun manufacturers, gun retailers? So you mm -hmm. can really see, and it's really helpful. Um, so the last slide, please. Uh, costs of war or something. Um, so I, like I said, right, gaining access to these investments and screening them uh, for weapons companies are just two sort of tactics and tools that we've used in our local campaigns to build these strong campaigns at the local level. And so there's some extra resources that I can send everyone. My email's on the screen. I'll post it in the chat box. But thank you so much. That was really great to talk with everyone here tonight. Carly, our thanks to you. Um, you know, you've you've turned you know, turned our attention to taking on powerful organizations, and I'm really pleased to introduce Brian Garvey, who has been doing exactly that with the Raytheon anti-war campaign launched by Mass Peace Action. And I think what's really exciting um, when we think about United for Peace and Justice is the way that this campaign has inspired other activists elsewhere who are also affiliated. And we hope this means that our network will inspire many, many more communities to take on this action. So Brian, um, you do so much with Mass Peace Action. You develop the youth voice uh, and you are in the working groups on the Middle East, Latin America, and the no Cold War um, against US sanctions. Brian, tell us about how Raytheon got launched and what it's been doing and how it's growing, the Raytheon campaign. Sure, and, and thank you so much for, for having me, Terry, and, and Carly for that great presentation. Um, I, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, how the Raytheon anti-war campaign launched. Uh, and it's a very personal story uh, for me because it's actually what brought me into peace uh, and anti-war work. Um, I had always cared about these issues, but what really got me out on the streets uh, was when uh, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, came to visit uh, our neck of the woods. He came to visit Harvard. He came to visit uh, MIT. Uh, and I realized that you know, I either needed to get out into the streets and join these people who were acting out of conscience, or I needed to stop talking about these issues. And so I went to a protest. Uh, I, I met some, some kindred spirits and I've uh, been doing this ever since. Um, and, and what came out of that visit was really the Raytheon anti-war campaign. Um, we wanted to localize these, these wars. Foreign policy can be esoteric. It can be removed. It, it can seem like it's so far away uh, from our day-to-day -day lives. But I'll tell you, that I, I just typed it into Google Maps and the headquarters of Raytheon Technologies is six and a half miles uh, from where I'm sitting. Um, so our, our never ending wars in, in the Middle East, maybe in a different hemisphere, uh, but an institution that is incredibly local uh, had massive influence and, and made massive profits uh, off, of, off of that suffering. Um, so that was the that was the idea behind the Raytheon anti-war campaign. We knew the mainstream media wasn't going to cover things like Yemen, even though it was uh, the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. Um, so we wanted to localize it. We wanted to tell people that you know this is a Massachusetts war. 
And this is our responsibility to do something about it. And if we're not gonna do something about it, who is? Uh, so that's how the Raytheon anti-war campaign was born. Uh, we've done dozens and dozens of educational events in the last three years. Uh, we've done demonstrations at career fairs. Uh, I, I personally have seen students uh, change their mind about applying to work at Raytheon Technologies. That person-to-person -person interaction, it matters. Uh, because, you know, people don't want to work for a company uh, that, that profits off of suffering uh, around the world. But, you know, you really need to reach out and, and talk to them. It, it makes a huge difference. Um, I'm sure most of the people on the call know about Raytheon and how wide their reach is. One of the biggest war profiteers in the world and one of the most politically powerful institutions uh, in our country. Um, and we talk about the bipartisan consensus on foreign policy. Raytheon really illustrates the point, right? Uh, Secretary of Defense Mark Esper uh, in the Trump administration came right from Raytheon. He was their head lobbyist. Uh, our current Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, came right from Raytheon. He was on their board of directors. So uh, Democrat or Republican, uh, these institutions, the military industrial complex, we know uh, has power no matter who's in charge. Uh, Jackie was talking about uh, nuclear weapons. Raytheon has their hands in nuclear weapons too. They've gotten a, a $2 billion contract to make the new uh, uh, nuclear capable cruise missile. Um, uh, and when I think about all these things that Raytheon does, the weapons that it makes, they don't make us safer, right? Uh, the, our foreign policy doesn't make sense. What it does is it makes money for companies like Raytheon, right? The, the war on terror was really won by companies like Raytheon and Lockheed Martin and General Dynamics uh, and Boeing. Um, I like to say that uh, the reason our military budget gets bigger and bigger each year, one of the main reasons is so these companies can steal a large piece of that budget as it makes its way from Capitol Hill to the Pentagon. And the dirty secret is a lot of that money never leaves Northern Virginia. Or, or in this case, uh, uh, the outskirts of Boston. Um, so, one minute, Brian. One reason why uh, uh, this campaign can be replicated so easily is because uh, Raytheon and companies like them uh, like to spread out. They like to uh, make sure that they have jobs in every congressional district around the country. But we can use that against them as well, uh, because no matter where you are across the country. Uh, you're probably not far uh, from one of these companies uh, will have um, will have a location uh, that you can target, that you can rally around, that you can bring attention to. Um, and uh, I know that my colleague Ken Jones is going to tell you a little bit more about the network that we formed, but uh, I just want to let people know that there is uh, a fight going on right now in the next two to three weeks, uh, about a $650 million arms sale uh, to Saudi Arabia. Um, in the next two to three weeks, every member of the US Senate is now going to have to vote on whether they approve this money uh, to, to Raytheon and the war profiteers. Um, so I would encourage you all to reach out to your members of the US Senate uh, and tell them to pick a side. You know, they're, they're either on the side of the people of Yemen uh, and the people of this country who desperately need these funds, uh, or they're on the side of Raytheon. Um, so, you know, please reach out. Uh, I know that you will. Um, and, and with that, I'm going to pass it back. Thank you so much. Brian, thank you for that introduction. And uh, I'm going to turn it over very quickly to Ken, because I think this is an illustration of how campaigns through a network do go national. Ken Jones is in Asheville, North Carolina, uh, where he is organizing uh, the, the North Carolina Raytheon campaign. Ken has been a draft resistor, a plasterer, a school teacher, a professor. He's a grandfather and a member of Veterans for Peace Chapter 099. Ken, welcome. Hi, and thank you, and good evening, everyone. Um, here in Asheville, we're one of those 
places that Brian just mentioned that is an outreach of Raytheon, um, we found out a year ago that uh, one of their divisions, Pratt & Whitney, is uh, opening a plant here in Asheville. Uh, Pratt & Whitney is headquartered in Connecticut, but they, uh, they have seven locations around the United States, and they're in over 40 countries. Uh, they're a very large corporation. They make jet engine parts for commercial and military jets, uh, and including the F-15, F-16, F-35s, uh, they make engines for them. Uh, they're used, these engines are used in 27 Air Forces around the world. So here we're concerned about the military involvement of Pratt & Whitney and also about the aerospace industry, which they represent as well, and its contribution to climate emergency. Um, we, as I say, we just found out a year ago that they were coming here, and so we organized uh, ourselves. We're a coalition. We're called Reject Raytheon, and um, we consist of, we started out as Veterans for Peace, DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, PSL, uh, Party for Socialism and Liberation, and the Sunrise Movement. Um, what I'm going to do is show you some slides here to give you an impression of what we've been at for the last uh, year. And um, most of what I'm gonna show you is uh, our, our um, street actions, just to show you uh, kind of what it looks like on the ground. Uh, okay, so that's our website. We've been at it for a year. As you can see, we're trying to emphasize positive, build a just, sustainable, and local economy. This is a, a aerial shot of the uh, 1.2, million square foot plant footprint that is being built in a forest area outside of Asheville. You can see it looks like mountaintop removal. It's right by the French Broad River, which we're concerned about, the environmental damage that's going to happen to the river. Um, the, uh, there's a picture I, you can't get, you can't see this from the road, the actual building of the plant, huge plant, but you can if you um, trespass onto the territory where it's being built. Uh, which I've managed to do once or twice or more. Um, this is our first action that we did about a year ago. You can see, I don't know if you can see, but there's young and old alike in there. And uh, we have these street actions and every single time we have them, we have maybe 20 to 30 people involved. So there's a level of enthusiasm, maybe because we're new at it, only a year. I know that uh, Tucson has been at it for many years. And of course, uh, Boston's been at it for at least three and more than that. Um, the, uh, whoops, went one too many there. That's our die-in that we did as our first action. I'll show you some of these images quickly. Uh, we did convene ourselves for the, uh, actually we celebrated the entry into force of the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And as Brian pointed out, um, nu nuclear is part of what Raytheon does. Um, we show up on the street quite often, every two weeks uh, these days. Um, sometimes not, but mostly that. Uh, there's one of our Veterans for Peace, the chairman, the, the coordinator of our Veterans for Peace chapter here, out on the street with us. Uh, we, there was a global day of action about Yemen and uh, we showed up right at the site of the construction, right where they're building the bridge. And there were a bunch of us out on the street for that. Mm. Uh, the land was given to Pratt and Whitney, a dollar for a hundred acres. And it was given by Biltmore Farms. Many people know about Biltmore Manor here in Asheville. Biltmore Farms is an adjunct to it. And we went right into the Biltmore Park where the headquarters are to um, show them what we think. Chamber of Commerce is, uh, of course, behind the development, this economic development. So we made an appearance there. EDC, you can see that banner in the front, Eco Death by Capitalism. EDC is the Economic Development Commission. It's a organization, public-private organization of public elected officials and the Chamber of Commerce. We've done banner drops from our interstate. We did a nine mile peace walk through Asheville see a couple of Buddhist monks there with us. Uh, we have a, a local peace pagoda that we are connected with. Um, we emphasize, this is the peace wall. We emphasize that uh, as the uh, cost of war project tells us, you get a lot more jobs when you have green jobs than you do with investing in the military industrial complex. 
we do tabling. Uh, we did a canoe in uh, the French Broad River is a place where a lot of people go for recreation. So we've gotten some canoes, painted them up, got out on the river and passed out flyers. Uh, part of the Keep Space for Peace Week, we um, got ourselves out and walked through, you know, Asheville is a tourist town. So we uh, walked all around town, uh, passing out flyers and letting people know about the nuclearization and the weaponization of space and reject right down as part of that as well, as you can imagine. We've been emphasizing climate change recently. We got this banner from the Backbone campaign out in Seattle. You can see behind that banner is the bridge they're building and the road they're building at all. Imagine that all being trees at one time, it's all forest. Uh, these are some of our younger members standing there with a sign in front of the bridge, one of our actions. Uh, as I say, we're emphasizing the climate emergency out there on the street. One minute, Canton. All right, thank you. Uh, we're about to, this banner here on the ground, you can see uh, we're about to, it's 18 feet long, we're about to join the holiday parade, uninvited, that's going to happen in Asheville here this weekend. We're going to just tack one to the back of it and carry our banners and signs. That's the a detail of that sign that we painted on there showing the melting of the earth because of warming and of course the bombs and missiles. I wanna end with uh, emphasizing or I say reiterating what Brian mentioned is a network that we're developing. And uh, the power of networks as was mentioned in the beginning of this session is so great that we've reached out to people around the country and even into Canada of uh, those groups and people who are opposing uh, war corporations, whether it be Raytheon or Lockheed Martin or Northrop Grumman or any of them. Uh, and at this point, we've met uh, four times in about three or four months. Um, we do, as you can see, have 30 people from all over the country, pretty excited about the level of uh, engagement we have. And we're growing. We keep wanting more and more people because the military industrial complex is everywhere. At the moment, we're mostly sharing experiences and strategies uh, Code Pink's involved, and so is Veterans for Peace, and both of them are strong supporters and will lend a national oomph to us. Most of our actions, all of our actions really are going to be local actions. And in fact, we're planning a week of local actions in uh, tax week, April 8th through the 17th. And all of us, all 30 of us or all of our locations, who have, however many we have at that point, are going to do local actions in a coordinated way. So uh, we're acting locally, but we're also making a national network. So, and thanks. thank you so much. I hope that has inspired people to think about actions that uh, start in one place or originated in one place for good reason, can be spread broadly. We're gonna turn now to the back from the Brink campaign. And I'm gonna introduce Denise Duffield. Her, I have so much information on all the wonderful things Denise had done, but let me just say briefly, she is the Associate Director of Physicians for Social Responsibility in Los Angeles, where she leads the PSR's Los Angeles participation in Back from the Brink, which is a national grassroots campaign to fundamentally change US nuclear weapons policy through local organizing and advocacy. Denise, let me turn it over to you. All righty. Hey, everybody. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, ooh, can I share? Advanced sharing options. Let me try this again. Share screen. Ooh, there it is. All right. And now you go over here. I should know this at this point. All right. How does that look for folks? Probably you might have to, if you need to looks see the good. Words. No, All looks right. good. Okay, here we go. So Back from the Brink is a U.S. national grassroots campaign for nuclear weapons abolition that is built on local community organizing. We have a five-point policy platform that I will get to shortly. The main strategies involved are local organizers who seek uh, endorsements of Back from the Brink locally uh, from organizations and from elected officials, and then build uh, teams or coalitions in the region and work together to get municipal resolutions passed at the municipal, county, and state level. Um, this process also allows us to reach out to different kinds of groups that we normally talk to um, and do uh, more intersectional uh, outreach. 
in developed partnerships. And the uh, end result of these endorsements and resolutions is that they become tools for legislative advocacy and they can help build the political will for nuclear abolition and fundamental changes yeah. in US nuclear weapons policy. I was attracted to this campaign and decided to put my efforts into this campaign because my background is as a local organizer, uh, uh, particularly um, fighting for the cleanup of the Santa Susana Field Laboratory, which is a former nuclear site near Los Angeles, former nuclear uh, research and, and rocket engine testing site that is massively contaminated and continues to harm the health of the nearby community. So when I heard about Back from the Brink, I thought, I can do this. I know how to do this. I know how to get resolution. I know how to get people to show up at meetings. And that, that began, my, began my participation in the campaign. The five um, policy points are um, actively, we call the United States to lead an effort to prevent nuclear war by actively pursuing a verifiable agreement among nuclear armed states to eliminate their nuclear arsenals, renouncing the option of using nuclear weapons first, ending the sole unchecked authority of any US president to launch a nuclear attack, taking US nuclear weapons off of hair trigger alert and canceling the plan to replace the entire US nuclear arsenal with enhanced weapons. We have endorsements from over 380 organizations and uh, we have gotten resolutions adopted now at over 54 municipalities and six state legislative bodies. These are cities large and small. So we've got Los Angeles, Washington, DC, Baltimore, Salt Lake City, um, uh, 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 Tucson, and then, you know, uh, towns and, and villages. And we also have the participation now of elected officials. We have over 300 local county and state elected officials who recently signed on to a letter um, to Biden and members of Congress urging bold action on nuclear weapons, particularly ahead of nuclear pasta review. And again, um, I think everybody, most people on this call probably uh, believe that real change starts from the bottom up. And that's what this campaign um, is, is, uh, is, is our central tenant. So here are just some of the, the um, some photographs from some of the efforts that have happened around the country. People can't take action on something that they don't care about and they can't care about something they don't know about. And right now, too few people know a damn thing about nuclear weapons, um, the dangers they pose, the growing threat and their impacts on our environment and um, their tremendous um, financial cost as well. So these resolutions allow us to make a very succinct argument. Elected officials are not often gonna take time for the day to talk about this issue or to read papers, but they can read a two page resolution. You can put the footnotes in there um, if they have any trouble with the information. Um, building a coalition is how we started. This is Los Angeles Coalition for our resolutions. We had students involved. We have Habakasha, we have public health officials and doctors, climate change activists, a Veterans for Peace was involved, um, Beyond the Bomb, other peace groups. And that's who we pulled together for the effort. Um, uh, the, another step in the process, I mentioned getting local endorsements. So this is what the folks in um, uh, 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 Oregon did. And these are some of the groups that they were able to pull together to help them with their resolution efforts. And you can see um, there's quite a diversity of the kinds of groups that were involved in that particular effort. Um, it's also great because these resolutions, while we have a sample one on our website, groups can customize them, make them very specific to their municipality, to their area. Um, statements about the cost of nuclear weapons are particularly powerful, like they were in the case of Baltimore. Other resolutions do include um, statements about uh, calls for divestment, uh, diplomacy with Iran, uh, nuclear weapons free zones, so they really can be home to the community. Um, if you want information on how much nuclear weapons cost your community, PSRLA has been doing, and Dr. Dodge, Bob Dodge, who's on this, uh, in this webinar right now, has been doing this for over 30 years. And we have on our website where you can go and calculate the cost or we can help calculate that for you. Um, I think the resolution process and the, talk, the public awareness that we do through this um, campaign uh, is most effective when we're able to have uh, the voices of impacted communities represented. And this is a photo from the Los Angeles resolution. And you can see from the, 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 the looks on the people there, they don't hear this information very often, but when Junji Sarashina got up and told the story and testified for the resolution, he had everybody's attention. Marshallese, okay, uh, Marshallese community, U.S. downwinders, uh, other um, communities impacted by nuclear waste and contamination and veterans are also helpful to the effort. Folks that put in a, a statement about the treaty on their prohibition of nuclear weapons uh, then become part of the ICANN Cities Appeal. And we have plenty of advocacy tools on our website. So again, as I said, organizing tools, resolutions, sample um, resolutions you can download and, and modify. 
and then use these in legislative advocacy. It's one thing when you tell somebody 70% of people oppose nuclear weapons, but when you tell an elected official, these cities in your district, these organizations in your district have signed on to this, it makes a difference. And so here's our information, preventnuclearwar.org, our Facebook, our Twitter, our email. And finally, because I am a local organizer, I have to promote this movie, In the Dark of the Valley, which is about the Santa Susana cleanup effort and the horrible impact on local communities. If you want to talk about bringing the, the cost of war home, you really need to see this film. It's going to be on MSNBC this Sunday um, at 8 Eastern, and there's plenty of other ways to see it as well. So I've done my due diligence as a Santa Susana organizer as well. Thank you. Brilliant, Denise. Thank you so much for the incredible breadth of your presentation. I'm going to turn it back over to Jackie, who does not need to be introduced again. Jackie Cabasso is going to speak about the Mayors for Peace um, organizing effort, uh, which is clearly something that we can be doing wherever we live. Jackie. Again, and I'm going to take you through a Mayors for Peace action toolkit that I have just updated, which you can find on the United for Peace and Justice website, which is where I'm starting here. And I'm going to show it to you and kind of walk you through it. To find it, you go to resources and just click on the resource link and scroll down. And you'll see Mayors for Peace action toolkit. So Mayors for Peace was founded in 1982 during the United Nations or at the conclusion of the United Nations Special Sec Session on Disarmament. That was the time when there were a million people in Central Park calling for the elimination of nuclear weapons. It was founded by the mayors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And it's working for a world without nuclear weapons, safe and resilient cities, and a culture of peace as essential measures for the realization of lasting world peace. As of November 1st, 2021, Mayors of Peace has grown to 8,054 cities in 165 countries and regions. There are 220 US members and the total membership of Mayors of Peace represents over 1 billion people. Um, Mayors of Peace's next membership goal is to reach 10,000 member cities as quickly as possible. So I would like to ask everybody to invite, find out if your mayor is a member, and if not, invite them to join. And you, this is, you can click here, is your mayor a member? Uh, it will take you to the Mayor's of Peace website. All right, or maybe not, maybe not live. Huh, okay, I don't know what's happened. Let me try it one more time. I was planning to show you these links, huh? Okay, this link is being glitchy. All right, we'll move on. So one thing that may be surprising is to look at where the member cities are now. And this is the top, the top 10 countries with mayors of peace. So you'll see that Japan, maybe not surprisingly, has the most members. Mm -hmm. Iran has, has over a thousand members. Germany has 776, Italy 517. Uh, Nicaragua has 155. Well, this was perhaps not a democratic decision, but the, the uh, president of Nicaragua actually arranged for all of the member mayors to join Mayors for Peace simultaneously. So there are many different situations around the world. But can we catch up a little in the United States? Um, so there are lots of resources here. Um, there's a Mayors for Peace introductory video here, which you can take a look at. And this is one of the main successes we've had in the United States is that the US Conference of Mayors, which is the uh, national association of over 1400 American cities with populations over 30,000 has unanimously adopted mayors to peace resolutions for 16 consecutive years. And these are strong resolutions uh, and resolutions adopted at annual meetings become official US Conference of Mayors policy. So in 2021, the resolution that the U.S. Conference of Mayors adopted is named calling on the United States to welcome the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons and to act now to prevent nuclear war and eliminate nuclear weapons. And this, okay, never mind. Mm -hmm. um, this one calls on 
re relevant to the cost of war, it calls on the President and Congress to cancel the plan to replace the entire US nuclear arsenal with enhanced weapons and to redirect funds currently allocated to nuclear weapons and unwarranted military spending to address decades of inaction on infrastructure, poverty, the growing, growing climate crisis and rising inequality. And it urges all US mayors to join mayors for peace to help reach the goal of 10,000 member cities. The 2020 resolution, which was entitled calling for human centered security in a time of global pandemic <laughs> actually uh, affirmed support for the back in the brink campaign for the third year. Uh, as the mayor of Des Moines, who is the U.S. Vice President, Mayor Sapisa said, if you don't think nuclear weapons are a local issue, ask the mayors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So to help Mayor Sapisa reach its goal of 10,000 member cities, find out if your mayor is a member of Mayor Sapisa. Click here for information about how to register, examples of member city activities, and a letter of invitation from the mayor of Hiroshima. And then most importantly, for the purposes of networking tonight, if you're planning to ask your city council to adopt a back from the brink resolution or the ICANN cities appeal or some combination, ask your mayor to join mayors for peace at the same time. Now, let me see if this link works on the back from the brink campaign. Um, uh, why are these not working properly? All right, never mind. Um, but you will find in there under the in the back from the brink advocacy tools you'll find this same toolkit because we've been working together um the ICANN cities appeal also links to mayors for peace if if you are um, submitting a resolution proposing a resolution include an operative clause in your resolution making it city policy for the mayor to join mayors for peace uh, you can also use language from the U.S. Conference of Mayors resolution to draft and incorporate into your city council resolutions. Here's some other ways you can use the resolutions, which I think are a very underutilized um, resource. You can take copies of recent U.S. Conference of Mayors resolutions to meetings with members of Congress or their staff, or use it in your correspondence. Time, Jackie. Time. Time? Okay. So let well, me just say that. I'm sorry? So we will get all of, I mean, all yeah. of these materials are up on the UFPJ website. Mm -hmm. You can go there. Right, and there's other lists of things that mayors can do. So I, I urge you to take a look at this and see if how you can work it into what you're already doing. Thank you. And now I'm gonna to turn to Helen Jackard, who's with the Veterans for Peace oh. Golden Rule, which has been an incredibly moving, powerful <laughs> effort to um, historically build understanding about your policy and is now uh, has, has traveled around the world and is now um, clearly involved with developing local actions um, that I think many of our communities can join in. Helen is also, um, that the project is also part of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom and many other anti-nuclear organizations support it. Helen, can I ask you to come to the fore? Are you muted? Am I unmuted now? That's thank better. I hear you, you now. Thank you very much for these great. Thank you very much for these great presentations. And we work both at the local and national level. And um, you know, Veterans for Peace is um, has just started a nuclear abolition working group, which is putting out a new nuclear posture review. You should see it within the next few weeks and um, think that it's something that some of your organizations would like to sign on to. But I'd like to first um, go back to the very topic of this um, conversation, the cost of war at home, because it affects veterans so much. Um, as a consultant for Veterans for Peace, I work with veterans every day, and those who saw combat are um, the, you know, the heaviest burden of war. They're all around us. Um, and the, the toll on their physical and mental health is enormous. And their families are affected as well, often experiencing abuse at the hands of their loved ones that they care for. 
Um, veteran suicide is rampant, averaging 22 per day. And so the moral injury of killing takes quite a toll. Even military training is um, an insult to your soul. It's hard to kill somebody that you don't hate. And so what the military has to do is teach people to hate mm -hmm. others, um, which is racism. Mm -hmm. Veterans, when they come home, they're often working as police. And you know, most, a lot of times the police are dressing in military uniforms and they're using military surplus equipment in the city streets. Um, so the combination of racism and military style policing has quite an impact on our divided society. But beyond the effects on veterans, um, war has a big effect on people and the environment. Um, so let me just go over some of the things that you've probably already talked about. Um, over half of our US income tax dollars go to war making. Um, 4.4 million people in the United States work for either the military or those contractors you were talking about that profit from war. Uh, the US military is the largest single consumer of fossil fuels in the world and therefore the, the has the most responsibility for climate change. The US has 800 military bases internationally and another 450 bases within the United States. A lot of these bases are EPA Superfund sites. Um, problems are toxic chemicals getting into the drinking water, explosives on the firing ranges, and noise pollution. And another problem with militarism in the United States is aggression. We are aggressive towards other countries. We don't cooperate with them. And so the, the military industrial complex only exists for war. And so this aggressive as aspect finds itself into every aspect of our lives. I'm gonna share my screen here. So I manage the Veterans for Peace Golden Rule Project. Sorry, I'm not seeing my page down button working. Okay. Hmm. Okay, we'll do it this way. Um, and it's a small boat with a big, big mission. And the mission is to sail for a nuclear free world and a peaceful, sustainable future. In 1958, the Golden Rule was sailed towards the Marshall Islands in an attempt to interfere with nuclear bomb tests. And they were stopped and arrested in Honolulu. And there was a huge public outcry over their arrest because this is a very publicized, well publicized event. Um, the huge public outcry led to a big anti-nuclear movement at the time, which gave President Kennedy the cover to sign the 1963 Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. In 2010, Golden Rule sank and um, Veterans for Peace found her, restored her, and in 2015, we started sailing up and down the U.S. West Coast. Uh, we participated in five Fleet Week protests. This is where the Navy brings their big machines of war into our cities. Um, in 2016, we participated in a water action against the Bangor Nuclear Submarine Base, which is 25 miles from Seattle. Eventually, we made our way back to Honolulu, uh, where we were protesting against RIMPAC which happens every two years and is um, brings you know dozens of militaries from around the world to blow things up and practice working together. We learned a lot when we were in um, Hawaii. That was where we learned most about the cost of war and militarism on the people. 25% um, of the land in Hawaii is occupied by the US military. One island was completely destroyed, Koho'olawe, and the cleanup is going to take millions of dollars and decades to complete. Um, 
Hawaiians are well aware of the nuclear threat from all directions. And they had this nuclear scare about three years ago that uh, people are still talking about. Um, I wanted to say that the Golden Rules next stop is going to be San Diego. We'll be there from January 11th to February 14th. Um, if you live there, I encourage you to get in touch with us. Um, and then after that, um, in September next year, we want to start the Great Loop. And this is a picture of our route. We'll start in Minneapolis and go south along the Mississippi River, around Florida, up as far as Portland, Maine, back to um, New York City, up the Hudson River and the Erie Canal, all around the Great Lakes and back down the center of the country. Um, we're going to need a lot of power. OK, thank you. This is a voyage that will be 10,000 miles in 15 months. And we're looking for help partners to help us with um, scheduling events to find crew and um, help us with fundraising. So we always could use some financial help. Our website is vfpgoldenrule.org. Helen, thank you so much. And I, to everyone who's been asking about how we all get in touch with one another, we will be definitely sending out that information uh, in the follow-up to this webinar. I, I now have the great pleasure of introducing the Reverend Liz Theo Harris, who is co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And we at UFPJ are very happy to be supporting this. I'm not gonna read her entire biography because I know that what she has to say is far more important for us to hear from. Reverend Theo Harris, welcome to United for Peace and Justice's Cost of War at Home. Well, thank you so much. It's great to be with you all. I was raised in a family that was dedicated to working for peace, uh, doing anti-nuclear organizing, doing all kinds of international connection. And so I feel absolutely right at home anytime I'm with UFPJ as well as Code Pink and, and all the different groups that are here. And so thanks for, for having me. Um, and thanks also to so many of the activists that are on here for the work that you're all doing and the work we're doing together in the Poor People's Campaign and in so many other movements um, in the country right now. Um, I wanted to start with a favorite quote of mine um, from Mrs. Coretta Scott King from more than 50 years ago. Uh, she said that I must remind you that starving a child is violence, that neglecting school children is violence, punishing a mother and her family is violence, discrimination against a working person is violence, ghetto housing is violence, ignoring medical need is violence, contempt for the poor and apathy towards action is violence. This was just about a year after her husband, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. called the US the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. And one of the things that I find most powerful about Coretta Scott King's quote is how it pulls us out of our silos, which we often comfortably sit in and reminds us of the importance of connection, of networks, of intersectionality. And as Jackie said at the very beginning, we can't win with uh, the peace people over there and those committed to civil rights over here and people concerned for a living wage over there and adequate housing and education and all, all everyone kind of divided. Um, but so just like in the Poor People's Campaign and in, if, in UFPJ and in Code Pink and in so many of the different kind of efforts and networks and groups here, um, you know, this quote and Coretta Scott King's life and legacy shows us that these issues are connected. And, and so then we must be, right? We know that the military, as we just heard, is the biggest polluter in the world. We know that war and the war economy is fueled by a poverty draft because poor and low-income people are compelled to enlist because of a lack of living wage jobs or opportunities for higher education. Um, the, we know that the wars being waged across the world are racist and imperialist wars. Um, and these intersections keep going and they keep going and they keep going. And, and that's why we um, are and must break through these silos and come together across all the lines that divide us and, and build a movement um, from below. Uh, none of this is, is anything different than what has been said all evening. 
if if it wasn't clear enough, if we already didn't all agree with this, if we just look at what's happening in Congress right now, we see why this is so important, right? Uh, folks might have seen that that this evening or today, the Congressional Budget Office just came out with a scoring for the Build Back Better agenda. Um, and that scoring basically says that uh, there it's going to be a deficit, right? Uh, we know that that agenda has already been stripped down uh, and that it started out many, many, many times less than what economists have been saying that the country needed to even just get back to where we were before the pandemic hit. And as all of us on this call know, uh, with 140 million people who are poor and low income, uh, when we had the level of military spending and military engagement all over the world, the, the level of racism and injustice, things weren't, weren't good then. Um, and so uh, to not even uh, kind of build back a little bit um, towards towards that um, is absolute catastrophe. But then for weeks and for months, the nation and mostly in, in Congress, especially in the Senate, has been debating whether we can afford, you know, to to expand health care and to lengthen the child tax credit and to increase the earned income tax credit and to provide a pathway to citizenship for immigrants or to have early childhood education and raising wages for essential workers and, and having a care economy. And, and politicians, as, as we all know, on both sides of the aisle have just been saying over and over again, we just can't do it. It'll cause inflation. It will add to the deficit. It'll hurt the economy. But we in the richest country in the world can't, can't believe the lie. Um, and the lies that we don't have the resources to lift from the bottom so that everybody can rise. You know, we on this call, we in the Poor People's Campaign have been crying that poverty and inequality, the lack of living wage jobs, uh, the kind of military investment that we have are what's really costing too much, um, costing too much in lost lives and livelihoods and actually even hurting our economy. Um, and, and folks here, I'm sure know that Congress is going to soon vote on a on a defense bill, right? And that that defense bill at this moment stands at seven hundred and seventy eight billion dollars. Um, even though the war in Afghanistan is over, the bill includes thirty seven billion more dollars than Trump's last military budget and twenty five billion more dollars than President Biden even requested. Right. Um, and, and that that bill. Uh, you know, actually has this nation spending more on the military than the next 12 nations combined. Um, and it's more money than uh, in real inflation adjusted dollars than than was in our military uh, at the height of the Cold War or during the Vietnam or Korean Wars, right? Um, and we know that this money is going to go to the Department of Defense, the only federal agency that hasn't been able to, to pass an independent audit in decades, right? I mean, we, we know all of this. And yet, somehow, uh, what's the debate in our, our country right now is, is about not being able to afford health care for our people and no debate about um, this kind of military spending. Um, and so this is where organizing, this is where networking, this is where mobilizing and movement building comes in. And, and so I go back, you know, again to another Dr. King quote, um, who he talks about kind of power, because um, that's what we need. We need power. Um, and he said that power for poor people, right, will really mean having the ability, the togetherness, the assertiveness, and the aggressiveness to make the power structure of the nation say yes, when they may be desirous of saying no. And so, so that's, you know, where we and movements come in. So this June, June 18th, 2022, the Poor People's Campaign and, and all of our mobilizing partners are going to be holding a mass poor people and low wage workers assembly, a moral march on Washington. We're seeing this as not a day, but a declaration a generationally transformative event, the largest gathering of poor and low income people in US history, right? And we're hoping that we're gonna to get to partner with all of you to build this assembly and this moral march, right? And, and, and so I think, I think many folks here already know some about the Poor People's Campaign. Many of you are, are very active in it, in fact. Um, but the Poor People's Campaign, you know, takes on these five interlocking injustices. We see the connection between systemic racism and poverty ecological devastation, 
militarism and the war economy and this false moral narrative of religious nationalism. Uh, our, our theory of change is that we should nationalize state-based movements, um, that we should shine a light on what's possible, not just pointing out everything that's wrong, that we have to shift the narrative, the narrative of what is going on and what's possible, um, and then build the kind of power, compelling power to make it so. Um, we're organized in almost every state across the country, and we are organized, much like many of the groups on this call are organized, into coordinating councils that are led by impacted people and moral leaders and clergy and activi activists and advocates. Um, and, and just like everyone here, we're persistent, we're intrepid, we're indefatigable, right? Um, and, and, and we know that we have to kind of create peace, we have to work for justice. Um, we, we, we follow the idea that Dr. King laid out that the Achilles heel, that the weak point of racism and poverty and militarism is actually to unite poor people, uh, low income people, marginalized people uh, across all the lines that divide us, especially race and geography. Um, and that it's, it's by, by kind of uniting people, organizing people that we can kind of become a new and unsettling force that can disrupt this kind of national complacency on war and on militaries and on racism, on low wages, and on so many injustices. Um, so I, I want us to get to, to, to discussion and to conversation and to questions. Um, but I also am a pastor and a biblical scholar. And, and I, I, don't, I, I know that not everyone and not maybe even many people on this call are, are people of faith. But, but I still feel like this moment calls for, for a little bit of, of story. Um, and a favorite one of mine from the Bible um, is this woman who is persistent um, until she's able to win justice. And I think it's a, a kind of model for the work that we're all doing here, uh, whether it's uh, caravans and, and, um, and, and embarkments and whether it's anti-Raytheon campaigns. Um, but, but, but in you know, Luke 19, we have a woman, a widow, who, who keeps on confronting this unjust judge, kind of demanding justice. And the story is clear that this judge, this powerful man, this wealthy man, someone who's caught up in war and empire, right? He doesn't care about any other human being and he doesn't fear God. Um, but this woman enters and enters and enters and enters and enters and keeps on coming, right? And, and she's a person who's been abused and used by violence and poverty and empire. And, and she probably starts out pretty small and then she starts bringing others with her. Um, you know, her first demonstration might be one or two, but then, you know, moves up to 20 and 30, right? And, and through that kind of work, she wins justice, right? The, the, the judge never, never kind of has a, a, a aha moment. Like we never hear that, that he changes his ways and he's, he, he finds, you know, the error of his position, right? It, it, the text tells us that, that the judge figures out that this woman is just never going to stop. Um, and it says that in the, in the Greek, that, that even though he doesn't care about people, he, she's going to give him a black eye. Now, I think this woman was nonviolent, so I don't actually think she was trying to beat him up. Um, I think the story is saying that, that her persistence, her organizing, makes him look bad, tarnishes you know, his reputation, makes his corporation you know, a little less shiny. And so in the end, she wins and she wins justice. She doesn't win a pittance. She doesn't win crumbs. She doesn't win like a little tiny concession. She wins the justice that she goes seeking for. And I, I think that that is the message of networking, of movement building, of organizing, and of the work that we're all doing here this evening. We have to keep at it. We have to keep coming and coming. We have to network and bring others in. And we have to pray you know, with our feet. And, and when we do this, we win. Um, and it means that we can win, um, not just be right, not just uh, try, but we can actually achieve justice. And so, you know, I'm so encouraged by the work that people are doing and so honored to be in this movement with you all. Um, and so looking forward to moving, as we say in our work, moving forward together and not one step back. So thank you so much for, for having me here with you this evening. Oh, Reverend Thea Harris, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy, busy life. And thank you for everything the Poor People's Campaign has been doing and will do and will achieve. Um, 
I heard, uh, I, I'm, I, you know, I heard two overarching uh, concerns. One was one was the the strategies and the techniques for building really broad, effective local coalitions for getting out of the silos and creating structures that um, that that are going to have power. Um, and, and the second big issue I was hearing was taking on those who profit from war and really questioning and, and knowing how to speak truth to their very, very immoral power. So I would, um, I, this seems, you know, we'd hope for a half hour of conversation. We don't quite have that. I don't know if people want to raise hands. Uh, call a stack in the chat. I'd like to recognize people who haven't spoken yet. Cynthia. Oh, I'm gonna hello ask everybody. <laughs> their comments to do about a minute so that we can get things moving, but Cynthia. Yeah, oh, hello everybody from Ohlone Territory in Berkeley, California. I'm with Code Pink, as you can see. <laughs> um, yeah, we are um, gearing up as part of this new national anti-war industry alliance, and Ken is part of it, and other people on this call are part of it, Carly. Um, we we want to look at Lockheed, we want to look at Boeing, we want to look at all the local um, facilities of the war industry right here, and they're everywhere, so I'm sure you have something in your community as well, and I'd like to really encourage people to join the campaign. Uh, it's gonna build towards something in the spring, something national. But meanwhile, locally, we're gonna go after Lockheed, we're gonna go after Raytheon, Boeing, whoever we can find, especially their CEOs, not their workers. We're in support, we're in solidarity with their workers. They need those jobs. But we want to highlight how the war profiteers are making billions on these forever wars and won't let them stop because that's their profit. That's their business model. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Great. Jonathan King, I want to recognize you. And I would like to ask other people, if you can just type stack in the chat, it'll be easier for me because I don't have a gallery view. But Jonathan, let me recognize you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very exciting to hear about these programs. Uh, one thing I'd like to add to Brian's report uh, that we've done in Massachusetts, which I think could be done in many other places in the country, is we found friendly state legislators and introduced into the state legislatures bills that would have the state pension fund divest from companies that manufacture nuclear weapons uh, and also divest from companies that sell uh, weapons to Saudi Arabia. So when you have a bill in the state legislature, uh, any resident of, of the Commonwealth can contact their state legislator, their state senator, there's public hearings. It allows a certain amount of education, just like back from the brink with the, um, the municipalities. But uh, in almost every state in the union, one or two legislators can introduce a bills. They all have state pension funds. And so this is something uh, we believe could be picked up across the country. Brian, maybe you could put in the chat uh, the link uh, to the, the two divestment bills because they're kind of templates. You can use the same language in Mer in uh, you know in Minnesota that you use in Massachusetts. Thanks Thank so much. You. Way ahead of you, Jonathan. Jonathan and um, Vicky, I'm going to call on you next, Vicky Ryder. Yeah, thank you. I I just wanted to pick up on Reverend Liz's mention of June 22nd, June 18th. 2022, um, we're organizing um, a filibus campaign, and that just means that every one of you needs to be thinking about filling a bus to bring your people to Washington so that we can all be there and, and uh, manifest our power. Um, every one of our groups can at least fill one bus, every church, every labor union, every campus. Please do what you can to fill a bus so we can be all together. And as I say, manifest our power at the Poor People's Campaign. We want to see you there. Vicki, thank you so much. Very important. Carolyn. Carolyn Scar. Um, can I unmute? Um, 
since some of us are growing older and looking at our retirement funds, how do we find out whether the county retirement fund or possibly a retirement fund that's just handled privately through an investment company is, who are they invested in? How do we, how do we shake them loose? Thank you for that question, Carolyn. Carly, I'm wondering if you can help answer that, but you're also next in the stack. Yeah, if I understand your question correctly, Carolyn, um, you know, we can look up investments in that weapons free fund and um, I, you, I'll drop my email in the chat and we can, uh, I'll, I'm always happy to go over with people individually because I know that that's so helpful and sometimes these financial documents um, can be difficult to read through. So we're happy to help you with that. And I, you know, just another comment I wanted to make about sort of coalition building generally. Um, you know, we worked on a campaign in um, Vermont, Code Pink and, and World Beyond War did. Um, and we, we initially started by, by looking at the Vermont State Pension Fund as a potential target because um, we thought that they might be invested in weapons manufacturers. But with the recognition that, um, you know, a recent uh, divestment campaign had, had attempted to divest from fossil fuels and failed because of a lack of real connection with labor unions in the state, we decided not to go after the state pension fund and instead go to municipal uh, pension fund in Burlington and deliberately try to reach out to the local unions in Burlington and the worker center there and say, hey, we want to work on this together. And they showed up for us at the city council meeting. And now we're working with um, some of the other local um, unions at the uh, who are staging a potential protest and maybe a an upcoming um, action at the medical center there. So we'll be working with them. How can we stand in solidarity with you? So we're trying to build from the ground up in Vermont. And I think that that's a model that we're trying to work on across the country because having the support and working in coalition with unions whose, who, whose workers obviously are, are affected by uh, pension fund divestment, I think is really crucial. So just wanted to mention that. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm just going to ask, um, especially some of our presenters, Denise, Ken, Helen, and Brian, if you if you want to think about contributing to this question that so many people are asking, which are, what are the keys to organizing a local coalition that is really broad and diverse and representative of, of diverse um, income and and you know identities but in the minute in the meantime uh, jackie is in the stack so jackie i'll give you a minute to say a little more okay actually that's the question i want i was going to answer well you um, can start then and we'll hear from everyone okay so um i said this earlier but in these short presentations it wasn't really time to elaborate much um, I think the key to, to organizing at the local level and at any level really at this point in time is to organize around common values and common vision, which needs to be articulated. So what that means in practical terms is that if, I, if we articulate an agreed upon set of those things, and my favorite example to use is Haiti. I work mostly on nuclear weapons. I, do, I know that Haiti is important and complicated. The Haiti action coalition was a member of the People's Nonviolent Response Coalition. When they needed help, I would know I could trust them because they were going in the right direction. And we would all pull together for Haiti. And then when we need something on nuclear weapons, everybody will pull together for nuclear weapons. I've seen it work. Um, but that's not that means you give up the primacy of your issue. You don't stop working on it, but you don't try to shove it down everybody's throat. You say, we're all in this together. I'll help you. Can you help me? Um, I think that <clears throat> actually the Poor People's Campaign is doing that. But that's why I'm so excited about it. And I think that one way people can start working together is to join your state Poor People's Campaign, uh, whether regardless of whether you're a member of another organization, that's not an issue. And one thing that is coming up that would be a very good local uh, network building opportunity is on April 4th, the anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King's Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break Silence speech. Uh, in Oakland, we have organized public participatory readings every year starting in 2003. Had to stop because of the pandemic this year. We're going to start again in front of the federal building. Uh, I took it to the California Poor People's Campaign. They're going to put out a statewide call for those actions. And 
we're going to approach national. So this is a heads up, Reverend Liz. <laughs> uh, and we have on UFDJ, we have a how to do that toolkit so you can do it in your own community. But you're bringing together people who are reading Dr. King's words together, not allowed to change the words, and then talk together about what it all means for today. Thank you, Jackie. I want to just invite any one of uh, our former presenters who wants to address um, the same question about building broad local coalitions, getting out of our si silos. Jackie said so much of, of what I wanted to say about, about speaking to common values. Um, these issues seem complex, but they're really not um, at, at their heart. Uh, and the strength that we have on our side isn't billions of dollars. Uh, it's the fact that our message resonates with people and they can feel it in their hearts. Um, uh, and, and I'll just second again what Jackie just said, because I just had this experience with the Poor People's Campaign and, uh, <laughs> and the National Union of the Homeless, uh, where, where folks were talking about extremely local issues at, at Boston City Hall. Uh, and then they were talking about the military budget in the same breath. The Poor People's Campaign does this so well uh, with how they describe the war economy uh, in, in this country. Um, right from that speech, uh, uh, when you spend uh, more on military defense year after year than on programs of social uplift, you're approaching spiritual death from that speech beyond Vietnam, uh, which is a speech that also helped to to bring me uh, into the work. When, when you spend this amount of money on, on, on war and destruction, it touches every issue. Uh, it's because of the opportunity costs. Um, and I'll just say, yeah, you know, Jackie said it better than I did, so I'll just pass it off. To well, you. everyone's words are contributing, I think, to inspiring us. Helen and then uh, Ken after Helen. Well, well, what we do is we invite guest speakers um, to talk with with whoever we're talking with. So we we hold a lot of presentations, and so we can invite PSR or Black Lives Matter or anybody to talk about not just their own issue, but it's also to talk important to talk about how they're connected. So we show up at other people's um, events and talk about our issues and like help bring nuclear matters to the poor people's campaign or um, help bring the matter of war to somebody else. Um, and so, you know, you, you got to show up and it takes a lot of work, but then you also have to invite others to speak. And I think that's how we can lend a, a better voice to people of color and youth and um, indigenous people um, that are often excluded from our little um, discussions. So um, that's what we would like to do. Thank you, Ken. You certainly had very inspiring photographs of very broad participation. What have you done that's made that really work for you in Asheville? Yeah, I wanna reiterate what everyone else has said about go to each other's events and meetings. That, that's one thing we've done, but I have a story to tell about how we actually coalesced into a group which is that when this, uh, when this was announced, this Pratt & Whitney coming to our town, there was a Buncombe County Commission meeting and a number of people showed up to speak against it. And um, we found each other there. Uh, I took down everybody's name. I emailed everybody. I, Sunrise Coalition was there. I went to their meetings. They came to Veterans for Peace meetings. And the point is that we went to each other's meetings and then we shared leadership. We don't have just one leader. And especially the young people uh, tend to be the ones who speak to the press, who speak out against climate change in particular. So it is shared leadership too. I, I just wanna really thank everyone who's spoken and everyone who's put questions in the chat. We have recorded this webinar, it will be available. There were many questions about how you might quote from it um, or share it. Um, we will have it on our YouTube channel. We'll also be really careful to um, record everything that went into the chat. And I will make an effort over the next day or so to go through and edit it and 
provide you know the links that people were supplying for all of you before we close i want to take um i want to short turn over to george friday who is ufpj's national organizer she has just launched what is really exciting us at ufpj the seeding young peacemakers program looking to the future and really um in teaching and and mentoring young people to do exactly the kind of organizing we've been talking about but more than that um you know mentoring them through organizing an event in their local communities and we hope this um is something that other ufpj groups um, will be interested in and can profit from so george all righty then so um i know that i'll go a few minutes which will put us right at 9 30 so our apologies for being a little past 9 30 as our stop time so seeding peacekeepers i'm so excited about this um you know we if we think about folks who are in college or folks who are under 30 and what their reality has been like for the last 20, 30 years, hmm, constant war, escalating fascism, um, the environment being destroyed, not a lot that really inspired us to be peacekeepers and not a lot about the history of the movement for peace and justice in the US. So um, seating peacekeepers is a way that through UFPJ, we can do some work on that. I have the privilege, I live in North Carolina, and I have the privilege of also working with North Carolina Peace Action, which is awesome. And we, in Seeding Peacekeepers, we identified teams of two or three young people per campus or per city or organization that were interested in both organizing training focused on peace and justice issues and ending oppression, dealing with white supremacy, racism, colonialism, empire. Combining those to really pass on, you know, I've been doing this y'all since I was about 13 and I'm 62. So there are a few things I know and I can pass those on and I'm really excited about that. So we have here in North Carolina, uh, Elon College is a site. In Western Mass, there is an organization that has a site. And in New York, in Niagara University is a site. At Niagara University, they're doing a fantastic project that y'all will be able to read a newsletter story about next month, or yes, next month, because they've taken a building on their campus that was a police station. I thought it was a military recruiter station, I was wrong. It was a police station with no authority from the university, but on their campus, they closed it, shut it down through the summer, these students that are working with us, and now they're gonna turn it into a student hub. And the student is writing up that story and you'll see the story and their photo in our upcoming newsletter, that's fantastic. One of the things that's great is of the six students that we're working with from three sites, they're all people of color, all BIPOC folks. And that was a surprise, especially when you think of the peace and justice world to do a project and all the participants, none of the participants are white. I was like, this is awesome. So it's fantastic work. Stay tuned because we'll have more to tell you about it coming up in the months to come. Basically we are doing about 24 hours of training over nine sessions and those end in early January. And then by March, each of the sites will do a project that they're choosing. I told you the one that they're doing in um, Niagara and the other two folks sites haven't figured out yet exactly what they're doing. Although in Springfield, Mass, we have some idea. You'll just have to stay tuned to find out more details. Terry. Yeah, well, I hope that's an invitation to you all to stay tuned to read the UFPJ newsletter, which always includes information about any member organization that wants to send in a report on what they're doing locally. We regularly report on 
the Poor People's Campaign. And I think, um, you know, tonight just shows that we probably have a great deal more exciting work going on at the local levels that we can be including um, in future communications. As I said, we will make a, a, a real effort. You will all be receiving, as will everyone who signed up for this webinar, a link to the recording of this. And uh, we will be working over the next day or so to extract the most important information that showed up in the chat and share it with all of you. I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank all of our presenters for really being incredibly inspiring. And I hope you all are um, going home with uh, great ideas for organizing locally, focusing on the cost of war at home, but realizing that we need to be united for peace and justice. So good night, all. <laughs>